Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. In this video, I wanted to kind of go back to kilonova, supernova, hypernovas and make a comparison between them really. What's the sort of energies involved and how do they compare? Which is the most powerful? So I have done separate videos on all of these, which you can check out individually, but I'm going to recap all three of these before we get to the actual energies involved at the very end. So if you've seen all those videos before, then skip towards the end. So we're just going to have a recap of supernovas, kilonovas and hypernovas before we get there, just in case you're not aware of what they are. So the two most common types of supernova are type 1A and type 2. One of those is the death of a massive star, that's type 2, and type 1a is a specific type of supernova that involves a white dwarf star and a red giant. So a type 1a is when you've got a white dwarf star, which is smaller compared to the actual red giant, which is on the left here. It pulls material off the red giant, so these are in a binary system, which means they're orbiting a common centre of mass. As that white dwarf star gets more massive, it increases in temperature. As it increases in temperature, it approaches the ignition temperature of carbon, which white dwarf stars are predominantly made of. Again, separate video for that. But once it reaches that ignition temperature of carbon, the whole star will go supernova. And that's your type 1A, basically. And because it happens at the same mass, it's always the same energy. Now, when you get a type 1A, the white dwarf star typically does not survive. So because the whole star is the same temperature when it goes supernova, then the whole star is destroyed, basically. So you don't get anything left over, generally, from a type 1A. Now, a type 2 is different. This is not a thermonuclear explosion like a type 1A. This is a core collapse supernova. So when a star reaches the end of its life, it's no longer fusing hydrogen or helium in its core, depending on how big it is. That core will suddenly collapse. There's no outward pressure holding it against the gravity anymore. So it collapses. It overshoots neutron degeneracy pressure. It has a rebound and you get a shock wave which propagates out through the outer layers of the star. That accelerates the material and you get this ejected material, which is then the supernova, which we actually detect. Now, type twos do leave behind some stellar remnant. So here you've got a pulsar. The pulsar is actually right in the center there and you've got some jets coming out and all the other stuff going off there. So you would get a pulsar, a neutron star, maybe a black hole if it was big enough. But a type two would leave behind some dense stellar remnant, not like the type 1A. Now, supernovae are very high energy. They will outshine an entire galaxy. So you've got an example here. And I believe, I think this was probably a type 1A, but it's going off in a spiral galaxy. And it's actually, it will outshine the whole galaxy. So these are very, very powerful explosions. Now, on to kilonovas. Now, kilonovas are not the death of a, a star. These are already dead stars. And it can be two neutron stars on the left, or it could be a neutron star and a black hole, which is on the right. Now, these are binary systems, which means you've got the two stars that are orbiting a common center of mass again. They're on quite a tight orbit. So they're orbiting each other. They are spiraling inwards. And in time, they get closer and closer to the point where they actually collide. That collision is then the kilonova. So the, the explosion we detect is the collision of either two neutron stars or a black hole neutron star, which we would actually classify or we would call it a merger. Not We wouldn't really call it a collision. We call it a merger. Now, a kilonova can be one tenth to one hundredth the brightness of a supernova. So they are not as bright as a supernova. And hypernova. Now, hypernovas sit at the very the other far end compared to kilonovas. So the hypernova ejectors, this is the material that's ejected during this hypernova, they have unusually high kinetic energy. 
And this, what's, this is what makes them stand out compared to a supernova or a kilonova. And they have 10 times as much kinetic energy as a supernova. So why does that happen? Well, during a supernova or let's just say it's a supernova in, in this case here, you get ejected material. So you have material that's ejected. That's what then creates those really nice images that we see, like of the Crab Nebula or the supernova remnants that we get. So we get this ejected material. Now, sometimes you get these powerful jets. So in the case of a hypernova, you get powerful jets being produced. You get two of them and they will then penetrate the supernova ejector. So they kind of punch through, essentially. Very powerful jets. Now, during that supernova, some of that material, that ejected material, falls back to the star. So the gravitational forces from the, the remnants of that basically pulls it back in again. So you've got some material that falls back onto, I've put star. It's not really a star anymore. It's this neutron star or black hole, whatever's left. As it falls inwards, if it's a fast rotating star, you get an accretion disk forming, which means you get a flat disk orbiting around in the direction that this object is rotating. And then the inner part of that disk is actually going to spiral inwards and fall onto that object as well. So that disk is essentially flowing inwards and falling onto the actual object itself. Now, when that occurs, you get relativistic jets forming, which are perpendicular to the rotation axis. So if you've got a disk in one direction, these jets are formed perpendicular, so at the rotation axis. So if you've got like a, a top and bottom axis of rotation, then you've got one either side, basically. So you get two of these jets that are perpendicular to the rotation axis. Now, those jets that then punch through this ejected material, they can accelerate the particles in that ejected material to 99% of the speed of light. That's where these enormously high kinetic energies actually originate from. It's these jets that are accelerating these particles in the supernova remnant. And that is what gives us the hypernova. Now, they can be formed possibly from the fast rotating or the collapse of a fast rotating massive star, like a type 2. But it's a very fast rotating star which produces the jets. Or it could be from binary systems where you've got something interesting happening in a binary system. Again, it's not fully understood, but a hypernova has these jets which accelerates this ejected material, which results in the observations we see of the very high kinetic energies. But the bit you're really, really interested in is the energy comparison. So we'll start with a kilonova. So I've given an example here of kilonova GW170817. Now, this was a merger of a binary neutron star. So you've got two neutron stars. They have spiraled inwards. They've collided. And this peaked in the visible part of the spectrum at 10 to the 34 watts. Now, that's 10 with 34 zeros on the end watts. That's an enormous number. And down on the, the lower left, you've got an actual image there of this particular kilonova. So it was actually observed optically as well as from the gravitational wave. So the GW part of its name is referring to gravitational wave with that number. That's what it basically means. Um, and the collision of neutron stars is one of the formation mechanisms or one of the mechanisms that produces gravitational waves. So comparing supernovas, we'll start with type 1A because these are likely the least powerful ones, the least amount of energy in these. These will always peak in with the same energy. It's the same object. They always go at the same mass. So it's always the same sort of energies. These peak in the visible part of the spectrum again, around about 10 to the 36 watts. So this is quite a bit more than your kilonovas. Type 2s are, these can range actually, because a type 2 is the death of a massive star, massive stars can have a range of masses. And the biggest ones are going to have the biggest energies. 
but they can peak with energies up to about 10 to the well, yeah, 10 to the 44 watts. That's 10 with 44 zeros on. That is considerably more than a Type 1A and a Kilonova. Now, hypernovas have about 100 times more energy involved here. So these can peak at around 10 to the 46 watts. So 10 times more than a supernova. So comparing all of those together, we've got a kilonova, and then a supernova might be 10 billion times more than a kilonova. Your hypernova then could be 100 times more than a supernova. So we've got some significant energies involved here. And the step up from a kilonova to a supernova, or the top end of a supernova, is a big step, basically. Now, finally, just to compare to the sun, because we can see the sun every day, it gives us a good kind of um, reference point, really. The sun's quite powerful. We know that we can feel that ourselves here on the planet. But to compare that to these explosions really puts it into context. So a kilonova has about 10 million times more energy than the sun. Supernova, a million trillion. And then a hypernova could be 100 million trillion times that of the sun. So these are enormous amounts of energy. And this is why we can see them at you know, such massive distances, because they're just so powerful. So thank you for watching. And if you have any ideas for future videos, then just let me know in the comments.